Hi. Um, cool. I think that I'm live. So I only have a few instructions about this um, uh, this video post. So I guess uh, the lovely ladies at Like Minded Bitches have asked me to share a little bit about my story and why I started the company. And then I guess I'm available for questions or whatever you guys might want to ask me. I think that that's the whole idea here. So um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name's Nairi. Um, I started Fame and Partners in earnest back in 2014. Um, I had spent about five years in venture capital prior to that. And um, I guess at the time uh, I had sort of prior to venture capital, I had spent um, many years in technology and e-commerce consulting wearing a variety of different hats. Uh, and so, you know, whilst in venture, I was paid to stay abreast of, uh, you know, internet trends. Um, and so it was sort of through that lens that I was, that I decided that I wanted to go out on my own again. And uh, I started actively looking for a new opportunity. Um, and I wanted to draw on all of my background and experience building e-commerce businesses and being involved in e-commerce businesses. But I could also see the, um, the distinct trend in, uh, by looking at the U.S. venture markets and the U.S. sort of e-commerce market around uh, e-commerce businesses that I felt kind of had overinflated valuations. Uh, um, simply because it's really quite hard to scale an e-commerce business and it's very expensive. So I was kind of more interested in not just creating an e-commerce uh, business, uh, but one that leveraged technology somewhere else in the value chain uh, to create a more disruptive model. Um, and so it's kind of like I... Uh, I just I came across these really interesting stats uh, in women's wear, and uh, the headline one being that 50% of women's wear is being cleared at markdown globally, and that 20% of women's wear being produced uh, was being cleared in secondary markets or uh, destroyed, which really only left 30% of women's wear being sold as it was originally intended. And so I figured, wow, there's a real supply and demand imbalance in women's wear, and this is the second most polluting, or fashion is the second most polluting industry on the face of the planet. I think that there's a better way to manufacture and sell women's wear. And that was the idea behind Fame and Partners. I created a brand uh, that's built on proprietary technology that allows us to make single custom pieces economically similar margin structure to bulk manufacturing on demand in two to five days. And always my intention was to learn how to do this myself with my own brand and leveraging my e-commerce skills, but then ultimately open up our platform to manufacture for others. So I can see some questions and things coming through. So um, that's like a very brief background on why I started the company. Um, so I've got, do you have teams of staff in both Sydney and LA? And if so, do you distribute your time between them? So this is a great question. Um, just a quick answer is that I do have staff in both Sydney and LA, and I also have an even bigger team in just outside of Shanghai. So I do split my time, although I spend around 70% of my time in LA and most of, and, and around 20% of my time in China and around 10% in Australia. And this is a real operational challenge because we are a multi-geography, multicultural business. Uh, and uh, building a business is hard enough, let alone layering in those cultural nuances and geographic constraints um, on top of that. And so, you know, we've had to lean heavily on uh, cross-border tools for collaboration. Um, and to be frank with you, it's almost like, uh, you know, um, how you might how you might feel anxiety splitting your time between your first company and your first child or splitting your time between children. It's like, I feel like I never get enough face time with 
any of my teams, um, which can be really, really challenging at times, and especially in the earlier stages of a company's life where simplicity and focus are so important. Um, I, I hope that answers your question, and if not, let me know if you want me to continue answering that. Um, so I've got another question here. Um, hi, May, by the way. Uh, hi, Tiziana, <laughs> back. Um, Elise, hi. So you say you're, uh, Elise is asking me, not a lot of women go for venture capital. At what stage in the business did you decide to raise? What made you go in this direction and do you have any general advice for women considering raising capital? Um, this is one of my favorite topics. So um, yes, I have a lot of advice. Uh, I think you're right that a lot of women don't go for venture capital and I think, I think that uh, women, especially in Australia, so if you look at uh, the statistics, there's around two million small businesses in Australia and uh, women comprise the greater proportion of those. Um, and I think that a lot of women, uh, potentially for lifestyle reasons, start have a greater propensity to start lifestyle businesses uh, that become uh, profitable really quickly. Uh, and they're more about fitting in with other priorities in their lives as well. Um, so I think that that means by, by default, there are a smaller number of uh, businesses that even need to raise venture uh, and scale. Um, so I think that that's part of why a lot of women don't. I think the other reason is a really sad reason, and that is that I don't think that there are the same channels uh, for women to raise capital as men, and that's simply because, especially in technology, you're dealing with two heavily male-dominated industries in uh, finance and uh, technology. And um, I don't know if you guys are following the news, but this seems to be a theme generally globally at the moment. Uh, women are finally speaking out against uh, discrimination and other, um, you know, even a, a, as far as sexual harassment as it relates to um, the challenges that women can often face in the venture capital community. Uh, and so I also think that this is something that puts women off. Um, I think that typically you're pitching uh, to, um, you know, male uh, venture capitalists and or financiers, whether they're like private individuals that are like angel investors, and they don't often don't even understand a business model that uh, targets women. Um, and they are definitely, you know, that last challenge is definitely a challenge that I faced. Um, fortunately, I'd spent many years in venture, so I kind of understood what uh, they were looking to hear from me. And I think that that's part of what drove our success over here when we when we raised. So then to answer the question about um, at what stage did I decide, well, I was always going to raise venture because, you know, there was really I'm building two businesses in one business. Firstly, I'm building a direct-to-consumer e-commerce brand. That in itself I probably could have bootstrapped. But then on top of that, we've built technology in the supply chain that allows us to manufacture custom and on-demand at scale. And that's required significant, you know, R&D and technical, uh, you know, technology investment outside of what you would typically see, far outside of what you would typically see in an e-commerce business. And so because that required additional capital, um, we had to raise money. Um, and so I raised money at the point at which I realized there was a legitimate business model. So I bootstrapped slash funded myself slash Use some, you know, got together some friends and family money to really prove that I could actually make and sell profitably, even if not immediately, ultimately um, custom dresses. And uh, once I'd sold my first seventy thousand dollars Aussie worth of dresses, um, predominantly driven through Facebook ads and a pretty crappy, to be totally honest, um, e-commerce shopping experience and a very basic version of our on demand manufacturing uh, set up, I went, okay, right, there's something legit here. And um, I set out to raise our angel round. And then after that, really every uh, every capital raise that we've done, um, we did an angel and then we did a seed and then we did a series A. Um, you know, every one of those venture rounds has kind of been linked to achievement of certain business metrics. Uh, and really what you're trying to do is understand what will unlock both uh, enterprise value and therefore by default 
uh, the next uh, metrics that uh, an investor is going to want to see to increase um, you know your valuation and and so in an e-commerce business typically what that is is uh, top line revenue growth and the acceleration of that revenue growth and then um, you know your contribution margin or your EBITDA margin which is predominantly in e-commerce driven by the efficiency of your marketing dollars um, any advice for women raising capital sure um, so you know, I, I, I've kind of uh, talked about this in a number of different interviews in the past, um, but get your pitch right and get it very clear. Uh, you want like a max eight page deck. Uh, you want to define your market problem and define your solution very clearly and very succinctly up front. Uh, you want your, you know, elevator pitch if you like to be a five words if you can. Um, so one of the catch cries that I used to raise money when I was pitching in the US uh, was Zara 2.0. That was kind of something that I talked about because immediately people understood, ah, there's supply chain efficiency, they're vertical, and they're selling trend-based women's clothes. So even though we weren't exactly like Zara and there's lots of differences, i.e. we're not fast fashion per se because of our price and our quality is higher, um, it helped a male venture capitalist understand what it is that we were doing in a quick way that sounded really appealing. Um, and then I would say, um, like I said before, uh, stage everything with capital. So understand what your metrics need to be to unlock value. Um, so depending where you are, in your business's life cycle, if, you're, if you are still validating your business model, you need to show on paper financially that, you're, that your economics stack up. And even if, say, you're not profitable today, that there's a path to profitability later. Um, if you're a business that has already proven your business model but you're looking to scale, then you need to be able to show again on paper how those funds will be used to scale and then again what that looks like economically, driving uh, both top line growth and um, EBITDA margin improvement. So um, that's kind of my advice there. So I'm going to jump on Emma. It says, uh, hi, Emma. <laughs> um, it says, hi, Nari. Did you struggle with international expansion at all? What was your biggest hurdle? So um, yes, I did struggle. <laughs> I massively underestimated the challenges I would face. Um, I'm not going to dress it up. There were... You know, you know, a whole bunch of challenges really. Uh, so the first challenge was that we dramatically cut down, cut back our Australian operation. Um, when I relocated our company headquarters from Sydney to LA, and the reason we relocated was because we raised money in the US, um, and you know, our core market, eighty percent of our revenues, were already coming out of this market, and so if we wanted to um, leverage, you know, strategic connectivity and relationships, then we needed to be here to expand further. And so um, relocate, you know, closing down most of our Australian operation at a really critical turn, you know, moment in the company's life and then rehiring people here in the US was very stressful. Um, firstly, we tried to relocate pretty much everyone from Australia, but Everyone wasn't in a position where they could relocate. They had families, they had other commitments, they had just bought apartments or whatever different people's um, personal situation was. And so that meant those people couldn't come. So we had to offer them appropriate severance packages. And then, um, and this is, you know, early days of startup. So, you know, you're still being really frugal with cash. Um, and then we had to, when we relocated 10 people, to the US and then we had to rehire and that first year of operations I think we hired 30 people in the US so you got to think at the same time as dealing with some pretty serious revenue scale like year on year we grew substantially between uh, 15 and 16 and then at the same time there's all these new people joining the team that have don't have the history so that was really tough. Um, so I would say that the biggest hurdle was, um, and sorry, and then, you know, there's the culture nuances again. You know, getting to, for me personally, understanding what it is to manage 
um, you know, Americans um, versus uh, Australians. And there are big differences and they're wonderful differences. And cultural nuance is something we deeply value in this organization now. But, you know, for example, generally speaking, Americans are, you know, more autonomous and they um, like to take the reins and they like to take risks and they don't like it if you give them, you know, uh, too much of a, you know, a heavy framework to operate within. Whereas Australians, generally speaking, again, these are generalizations, are very collaborative. You know, they like to work as a team and they want to make decisions together. And so contrast, that, that requires really different management styles. Um, and I think, you know, today now I can say like we're two years here in the US and, uh, you know, I think we've actually managed to take the best out of both cultures and we have this kind of like very autonomous, flexible framework and um, uh, at the same time a whole bunch of tools and processes that facilitate a lot of uh, collaboration amongst teams. And... Um, I think that, yeah, that gives us the best of both worlds. But I definitely think, you know, culture, uh, team uh, and hiring were the biggest, uh, biggest challenges for me. And, I, and my recommendation for anyone that is considering it is uh, definitely find one person in your new geography that you love and believe in and trust to lead it to be your key person there because in the first year, if, whether you relocate or not, there will be a lot of flux for you personally. Um, and so for me personally, that was finding a woman called Leah Steigel and she's our president and uh, COO. And she came to us from Tom's Shoes. She was the VP of e global e-commerce, which basically means she ran their entire global e-commerce business, which was, you know, um, many hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and I met her and she was at Tom's and she fell in love with what we were doing and uh, she joined our team. So I was really lucky to find her. Okay, so no worries, Emma. Uh, Gina, um, hey, how are you? Um, so Gina is asking me, which software do you use to manage customer service so your team can work together? I'm having trouble finding one. So we use desk.com, it's a Salesforce uh, platform um to you to manage all of our email and chat support um and uh i think that that works pretty effectively we then use in that's then plugged into uh slack so we our organization are heavy heavy slack users and unfortunately slack works in china as well so um that has been really effective for us and then we have a customer service um, uh, NPS score management tool called Delighted that is also plugged into Slack. So we can see interactions with customers. The rest of the organization has exposure to interactions with customers. And then also where our uh, customer service um, or customer uh, uh, feedback is trending um, as well, which is really great. Um, let me know if that answers the question, uh, Gina. But yeah, we rec I'd recommend desk.com. It's been um, a great tool for us. Oh, hi, Rebecca. How are you? This is Rebecca Tapp. I know Rebecca. Oh, so cute. Nice. Thanks for joining. Um, love the fact that she has said, love the fact um, you have built a business with an intention to be part of the solution to fast fashion. Why has this been important in your mission and do you think purpose and profit can work as a successful business model today and in the future, kiss, kiss? Well, big kiss, kiss back to you. Um, I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe that this could be uh, achievable. Um, just recently I did a talk uh, with Patagonia on sustainability um, and that's very much a focus for us. Um, and part of my talk centered around the fact that our manufacturing system um, gives us the ability to pay workers an average of three times more the typical production line worker, which is higher than uh, what is you know globally called the living wage. Um, and this kind of equality um, is really important to me, and improvement in working conditions is very important to me. Um, we're not all the way there yet. We're in the process of actually building a new facility, um, which will. Uh, both create more automation and um, facilitate more efficiency in our supply chain and will also improve the um, uh, conditions that the workers are in even more. 
Um, and we're doing things like partnering with a daycare center to provide an in, an in factory creation, things like that. Um, and I think very much so that that's what the world is about now. Uh, I'd, I'd like to think that we're in a new era where purpose and profit coexist very nicely together. Uh, and the funny thing about fashion is that there are so many layers to the industry that create, you know, that compound or put pressure on margin. And in a day and age of Instagram and a day and age of e-commerce, uh, brands have the opportunity to build a direct to consumer relationship and chop out a lot of the middleman, which opens up a whole bunch of margin. Um, and then I'll also say that again, through technology and automation, um, that creates an opportunity again to create more efficiencies in the supply chain and, uh, and, and simply manufacture for less. And so, um, so, you know, one of the core areas of focus for me, uh, in relation to the fast fashion piece is really manufacturing, uh, high quality items. Uh, for a lower unit cost such that we can actually compete with fast fashion pricing. Um, and so there's more on that coming from us next year. You guys saw us launch the anti-fast fashion shop this year as sort of like our little test. And that was like our way of sort of saying, okay, this is something that we're looking at. This is something we want to go into. But you know, our average price point was still around $200. And if you look at sort of Zara's Average price point, it's sort of closer to eighty or to eighty to a hundred dollars. So next year, we're really focused on, um, you know, providing uh, an assortment that is more in line with mass market prices, still high quality, and uh, still manufactured on demand. And we definitely see a path to doing that. So I'm excited. Um, hey, Andrea, so uh, great to see you on here as well, um, Christina. So. Oh, thanks. Um, Christina asks me, what advice would you give to those wanting to launch online retail stores when the market is currently already saturated with fashion startups? So Christina, I'm assuming you mean a fashion retail store um, uh, because uh, obviously retail could really span any product category, uh, but given you made a reference to fashion startups, I'm assuming you mean that. So. The first thing I would say is if you're going into fashion, do your assortment research first. So I think that, again, I, I said it before, we live in a day and age of Instagram. Um, the, 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 the barriers to entry are very, very low. And you have an opportunity more than any other time in the world to connect with micro segments. And because these segments, exist without geographical borders, they can still be huge audiences. Um, I mean, a third of the world's population is now on, uh, on, on Facebook. And so actually a little bit more than that. And so you've got to, you know, assuming that you can leverage uh, third party logistics and, and, and pretty much ship anywhere in the world, um, you know, you, you have the opportunity to be very narrow. And so what I would say is if you're going into fashion, research your girl first. Find, work out who she really is. Work out what else it is that she loves that resonates with her and start with one product. Identify where you think the gap is, identify what really resonates with you and start really simple. And uh, that would definitely be my advice. Get traction with one product category, one product group, or even one product first, perfect the product, make the product amazing, and then um, and then expand from there. Um, I would also recommend not spreading yourself too thin on, thin on the marketing side and setting up your e-commerce so that you have maximum agility. So if you think about it in terms of a conversion funnel, you've really got the universe of people, and if you're really narrow, you're already increasing the likelihood that those people will click and the cost of your clicks will be lower. And then if you think once you get them onto your site, you've got this massive tree of kind of like potential actions that they could take, and that is your conversion funnel. And at every point along that way, there's the chance that they will drop off. And so what you wanna make sure is that you have the tools to enable you 
to optimize every step along that way. So if you've got a landing page, you want to be able to change the copy, change the image, change the products featured, change the order of the page, so on and so forth, very, very easily, as quickly as every day, so that you can optimize um, the people that are clicking through, minimize your um, bounce rate, and absolutely maximize your through traffic so that you ultimately de increase your e-commerce conversion rate and, max and minimize your cost of customer acquisition. And there's heaps of tools out there that can uh, help you uh, do that. And I can add some comments later. Uh, if you have more questions on that. So, um, yeah, Kelly, uh, hi, Kelly. Uh, how important is social media being in the success of family partners? What other things have worked best for you? I assume you mean in customer acquisition. Um, and so social media has been pivotal. Um, our core channel, and we have by far, we have not even reached saturation yet, uh, which is, and saturation is when you, um, you start to see your cost of customer acquisition um, um, escalating or increasing because you uh, the the audience that's uh, looking at your ads um, is seeing it too repetitively. Uh, so it just ultimately ends up increasing your your CAC because you uh, reach maximum audience saturation. Um, and so we haven't even got there yet with uh, Facebook and Instagram. And so. I mean, I can safely say that um, there's a huge scope to be very efficient in leveraging just Facebook and Instagram uh, paid ads and a, and, and a combined organic strategy in many different ways. Um, and I would say it comes, <laughs> there's so many things to think about. In Facebook and Instagram, segmentation is crucial. Um, there's two general schools of thought with segmentation. One school of thought is that you go wide and then create lookalike audiences, uh, but that does require pretty substantial budgets up front. So if you don't want to take that kind of risk, instead I would go very narrow and create very small little micro segments and uh, test into those to see which ones you get traction with and then expand from there. So it's kind of like two opposite strategies and it depends how much money you have to burn in the beginning. Uh, and then I would be very thoughtful about the nature of the creative. So it's quite amazing. You can put the same dress, and you know, I'll talk in our experiences, you can put the same dress in a campaign image on an influencer, on an influencer in a still image, on an influencer in a GIF, on an influencer in a video, on a flat lay image, in a product image, and have completely different results in your click-through rate then your cost per click. And so for every different micro segment, you will find that there is a secret creative formula that you can work out um, over time to maximize uh, click through rate and minimize cl um, cost per click. And then I would then say that continuity of the narrative is crucial. So whatever's going on in your ad, you need to think about how to create continuity of that message onto your landing page as well. Um, and it's optimization of all of those things that has really worked for us. Um, so, uh, cool, I've got a question from Andrea. Um, uh, do you offer major order services to other labels as a manufacturer? If is not, if is it in the pipeline? So Andrea, I was talking about this at the start when I was talking about uh, my vision for the business. The short answer is it is absolutely in the pipeline. It's why I started the company. Um, our vision is to build an end-to-end -end manufacturing and retailing uh, platform for custom on-demand, first women's wear, and then later just clothing. So um, we are actually entering a pilot with some brands next year. And so if you're interested in something or you want to chat about it, uh, just send me a message and, um, yeah, and I can have a chat to you about it. Cool. Well, guys, I think that's about it. And I think the questions are all finished now. So, um, look, uh, this has been amazing. And hopefully you guys found um, some of the things that I said useful. And, uh, yeah, like... I'm really excited to be part of um, like-minded bitches drinking wine. I don't have my wine. Instead, I have my bottle of water. 
because <laughs> I'm not a big drinker. But um, yeah, cheers to you all. Um, love it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye.